The New York Islanders were in need. A decade after winning four consecutive Stanley Cups, the Islanders were flailing. By 1994, the team was bad, their building was worse, and their owner wanted out. The fans needed something big, someone to come in, buy the team, and restore them the glory. What they got was embarrassment, fraud, and John Spano. Spano was able to fraudulently buy the Islanders without having the money and without getting caught until it was too late. But it makes for an insane story. Hey everybody, I'm Patrick Jones and welcome to The Vault, a show about true financial crime. Today we're talking about John Spano's incredible attempt to buy the New York Islanders for $165 million when he wasn't worth $5 million. Born in New York, but raised in Ohio, his friends always said two things. He was a big storyteller and an Islanders fan. Prior to 1995, he lived in Dallas, Texas, where he enjoyed a good life. He owned a modest business called the Bison Group that leased small aircraft. He had a wife and friends, high rolling friends too. He probably felt like a small fish in a big pond, and he was ready to change all that. It's not exactly clear why in 1995 John Spano started taking an interest in buying NHL teams, but it all began with him trying to buy a half share of the Dallas Stars. Spano reportedly spent six months hanging around the team's office leading up to the purchase, but when it came time to pony up, the excuses started flying. And according to the Stars owner at the time, Jim Lights, the excuses were flimsy. They ranged from issues with the minor league team to having to wait until his guys from South Africa came in to meet everyone. The deal was eventually abandoned. In May of 1996, Spano then tried to buy the Florida Panthers, but that deal fell through when the owner decided not to sell. As these transactions fell through, NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman was quoted as saying that John Spano was the type of person we wanted to be an owner. Be careful what you wish for. By October of 1996, the desperate Islanders had their savior. John Spano, who was deeply in Commissioner Bettman's good graces, was rush approved. Spano had convinced the league and several large banks that he was worth $230 million. At the time of the sale, he had an $80 million loan from Fleet Bank, which he had obtained through falsifications, and a vice president from Comerica vouched for his wealth. The VP later said his approval came from forged documents that he didn't have independently checked. At the time of the announcement, fans chanted, Save us, Spano, from the stands. General Manager Mike Milbury drooled to the press over being able to spend Spano's money on free agent acquisitions, and all seemed well again in Uniondale, New York. The Islanders were back, no, in bigger trouble. The deal closed on April 7, 1997, and the holes in Spano's statement were already apparent. Frankly, there were holes apparent before this. Spano skipped out on a $20,000 fee he had owed a consultant who was helping him work on the Dallas Stars deal. And when the first payment was due with the Islanders, the excuses started again. Spano supposedly said there was a fire at his office, and another time he blamed a bomb going off in England's underground from stopping a payment. I guess he figured he then needed to actually fork over some money, he just wasn't sending the right amount. When a $5 million payment was due, he sent $5,000. And two $17 million payments ended in one check bouncing, and the other one only had $1,700. John Spano wasn't putting his money where his mouth is, and the fraud was very apparent. After not getting the money he was owed, the owner at the time, John Pickett, asked the NHL to step in. At the same time, Newsday, a major paper located on Long Island, acting on tips from Islander staffers, began a major investigation into Spano. It proved to reveal the tricks behind the magician. The report revealed Spano had said he had a large inheritance from a dead relative. It turned out to be only worth $220,000. He claimed his company, the Bison Network, which started in 1990, had 6,000 employees in offices all around the world. Turns out, they only had 22 employees. He said his house was worth several million, but it had a large mortgage on it, and he was late $85,000 in back taxes. And it found he was worth only $5 million. And the cherry on top was that the report revealed the feds had gotten involved. When the warrant for John Spano's arrest went out, he originally fled to the Cayman Islands, 
but returned and ultimately pled guilty on October 8, 1997 to fraud in courts on Long Island and in Texas, and then on January 13, 1998 to bank fraud for obtaining that $80 million loan from Fleet Bank illegally. It's just amazing. What ultimately snagged Spano is the fact that he wasn't able to make these payments when he knew all along he wasn't going to be able to make these payments. For his crimes, he spent more than five years in jail, getting out early under the pretense that he would spend five years under supervision. But his behavior became more of the rule than the exception. Since his initial release in June of 2004, Spano's gone back to jail for things like theft, fraud, forgery. The latest sentence is for 10 years and began in 2015. He just didn't learn. Speaking of not being able to learn, the NHL looked really bad here. The Islanders and Gary Bettman were completely embarrassed. Apparently at the time, the NHL was spending $30,000 to have a major accounting firm to look into prospective owners. They didn't do that here. In fact, they spent less than $1,000 investigating Spano, and they got burned. As for the Islanders, they eventually found a new owner and a group led by Howard Milstein. The team was sold and they were able to flourish. I mean, they've only won one playoff series in 20 years, but at least no one's robbing them, right? <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please like, comment, subscribe. Thank you for watching Cheddar. We've got plenty of fun stuff coming your way.